there we go. And here's our here's our housekeeping slides. Tony, this is a uh, if you're ready. I am. The doorbell stopped. The dogs are quiet. Uh, they all knew you had something to say, just like I do. Jeez, how many of these have we done? And we've never messed up this bad. So I apologize, everybody. Uh, I guess we'll 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 fall on our sword to you all and uh, tell Mike he can never go on PTO again. So, That's right. Um, so moving right along, we got a little bit of catch up to do. Uh, we we appreciate everybody's time here this afternoon. Um, hey, we. we as, as I, I, I do the introductions on this, we, we really do this out to, for, for, for two reasons. To, and it, this is all for our existing customers. Uh, what we're doing is allowing you all, as people come and go, change roles within your company. So this is an opportunity for you to get new, new issue track system admin people trained and up to speed. And then it's also just a continuing education to take your system admins, let them really go to the next level and become an advocate and more of a resource for, for your organization. We do these monthly. We do the second Thursday of each month. It's uh, at one o'clock Eastern. and We do it for about an hour and a half, two hours. We realize it's a big block of your time. Uh, so you can pop off as, as needed. You can come back. They're also recorded. Uh, if we navigate to the issuetrack.com at some point, Paul always uh, shows up where those uh, webinars are recorded so you can come back. You can also share these. So as new team members come on board, you can use these as a resource. Uh, uh, we're, we're down a man today. I'll be monitoring the, the chat as well as the Q&A once I turn this back over to Paul. Feel free uh, to answer, ask any questions. I'll try and answer them. Uh, also, depending on time and the content, uh, maybe throw them out to Paul so he can navigate, show you the answers there uh, as we do that. So for today, we got uh, we're going we broke it into thirds, if you will. We got the the 30 minute usage portion of it where we're going to talk about uh, the customer service usage, uh, how issue track supports that that usage within your organization. We're going to be talking a uh, deep dive on, on a particular feature capability of the product. So we're going to be doing the, the asset management module. It's not going to be what you think, or it, some of you it will be, others it'll be a different twist on it for you. Uh, Paul's uh, going to be introducing a new feature. It's hot off the press. It came out in version 12.2. I pulled up my issue track site, scrolled to the bottom, and this release is less than two weeks old. So it's a new feature that's out there. I like it. It's been something that uh, has been uh, needed for a while. So I'm glad we, uh, we provided that to our customers. And then we, we turned it into the formal Q&A session uh, so we can answer any questions for you that we haven't been able to address in the past. Uh, any of those that came up earlier and I said I'll bring them up, that's probably the time I'll bring them up if I haven't done so already. On the next slide, uh, there's yours truly, uh, back before I started growing a beard and my hair turns gray. Uh, I'm the newbie here at Issue Track. I've only been here about 10 years. Uh, Paul's one of the old timers. He's, uh, he's my go-to guy. On, he grew up on the support side of Issue Track. And then he moved to the dark side on the configuration. So he's, uh, he onboards my new customers as well as anytime we got an existing customer that reaches out to issue track through the support channel, through the, the sales engineers, PS, hey, can we do this? How would we do this? Uh, we usually turn it into an hour long conversation. And more often than not, the customer's good to go after an hour. Every once in a while, we, we need to turn it into a longer engagement. So Paul's uh, got a lot of uh, skill set there. That said, I'm going to turn it over, mute my microphone so you don't hear my dogs, and I'll be moderating. Thanks, right. everybody. Um, so just like uh, I want to do this now before, because I'll forget if I wait till later. Um, let me make sure we've got everything kind of set here. 
I'm going to come out of this uh, slideshow before we get into our our monthly, our, our real topic this time. I want to show you guys um, where you can get the pre-recorded webinars, and I want to do that on the front this time. Um, so I've got it bookmarked, and you guys will see the URL and kind of where those are located um, in just a moment. Not phone tools. That'll be in uh, the monthly webinar. Um, our marketing team, our web team, has put together this fantastic page that not only can you see the topics for today's webinar, but it's also got a link to the webinar archive right here. And this is issuetrack.com issue track dash monthly dash webinar. But if you go to issue track.com, you'll be able to find it right there from issue track.com. And when you go to the web the archive, then you'll see all of the past webinars. And I'll open that in a new tab for us. So this is all the, the past times that we've done a webinar and, and the, uh, our media team has nicely cut that into parts. So you don't have to listen to the full webinar. You can just adjust to the part that you're interested in. All right, enough about that. Um, and you can see it's all available at issuetrack.com. Um, this part's under VOD webinars, which is under resources. But it's also, um, you can also find the webinar page itself from issuetrack.com. All right, so enough about housekeeping, enough about sort of the, the normal topics. Apologies for the, the technical issues we had. Um, I would, uh, we will take responsibility, right? We're gonna fall on the sword. But um, you know, it was something going on with the uh, with the Zoom uh, webinar. Um, we had it uh, started up, and we're, we're waiting for everybody. Anyway, so welcome everybody. Uh, I see a few more people that I know. I see Paul is in here, um, and I also see uh, Ed, right, from our developer team, uh, important guy there. Um, hello, Ed. Um, sorry to call you out in front of everybody there. I see Dino's with us. Uh, a lot of folks are with us that I know, um, and as well as a lot of our customers that I know. I see you, Jessica. A bunch of folks. So this month's topic, so let me get to what you really came for, what we really want to do. This month's topic is customer service. And um, so I've, I've prepared something for us and kind of about this. And uh, usually we, we think about customer service as kind of low hanging fruit for issue track, right? Issue track is very good. We're, you know, we're, it's very easy to use issue track to provide good customer service or customer service type requests. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to not just to give lip service to it, I kind of wanted to turn and, and face that, right? I kind of wanted to, to turn that on its ear and really describe what's going on there um, and, and get into some of the tools in issue track that make that happen and that can help your team give good customer service to your internal and external customers. I, I, and you'll find that I kind of tend to bias more towards the internal customers. I mean, more about that as we kind of go along here though, all right? So, um, to start this whole thing off, when I, when I started thinking about the content for today, uh, the first thing I did, I always like to start with vocabulary, right? So, uh, you know, the first thing I did was I, I did a, a Google search for the, um, for the, uh, the, the word customer service. So what is customer service? And I found this definition right here, right? Customer service is the assistance and advice provided by, to, by a company to those people who buy or use its products or services. So buy or use, right? So we wanna keep that in mind, even that definition, right? It gets, you've got the buy part in there, the people who buy your products and services. But remember that the biggest thing that your company probably creates is not products and services, it's probably processes, right? It's probably all these internal processes that make those products and services happen. And you also have consumers of those, those are your internal customers. So like I said, the people that use your products and services, those are your, in, some of those are your internal folks too, your internal customers. So I, I don't want to turn away from those. I want to embrace, I want you guys to embrace that customer service mindset when dealing with internal customers, as well as the people that are actually paying you money, the people that are your external customers. All right. And there's my source. If you guys wanted to follow up on that, um, you can see I, I went out. I, it was the best uh, Google result that I saw. All right. Um, so, you know, that definition is necessarily kind of broad, right? It leaves us with internal and external customers. It leaves us a lot of leeway to talk about what customer service is. So the next place I kind of went with this was um, early on, I kind of identified this idea that customer service is different from something that's called customer support. And 
See, I even did a Google search on it. You know, what is customer service versus customer support? And here's the result that I found, right? Now, for the purposes of today's lecture, right? I, and I kind of disagree with this, right? I don't think there is a difference. For the purposes of today's lecture, we're gonna say there is no difference between customer service and customer support, right? If you guys wanna debate that, if we wanna come back and have a three hours of discussion about the difference between the two, we can do that in a different form. We'll do that in a different place. Um, just let us know if that's something you're interested in, all right? Um, but that's not for today. For today, we're gonna to say customer service and customer support are the same thing, right? So let's kind of dig in here, right? Uh, so here we go, you know, I told you guys, I warned you guys that I was gonna kind of bias today towards our internal customers, right? Because we tend to think about a customer as somebody who gives us money, right? But your internal customers, right? They, they don't really give us money directly. They make that money possible, right? Um, the idea is when you're doing customer service, when you have an internal request, customer service doesn't stop and start with the guy that's paying for that product or service, right? It starts inside your walls. And if you don't have things ready inside your processes and your people straight inside of your walls, then you're not going to make be able to make your external customers happy. Now, your external customers should drive the things that you do for customer service, right? They should drive the decisions that you make so you can become better at servicing them. But you can't forget about the guys on the inside because if they're not on board, then you're not gonna get very far with any of your customer service initiatives. Um, I would speak to this, and, and, and let me kind of speak to this in a different way, right? Let's get this in a different way. Um, the idea of, of those internal customers, right? I was, uh, as you, if you guys had, had a quick read over my card, or those of you that know me well, know that I was a, used to be an auto worker. You know, before my career here at Issue Track, I worked at a, a local, a uh, domestic automaker, they had a local plant here, and uh, the, the name of the company had four letters, and it, it began with an F, and it wasn't Fiat, right, and they were domestic. Um, so now that I've told you who I it worked for, right, um, so we went through an ISO 9000X audit. Well, I think it might have been a 9001 audit by that point, or, or something like that. This was back in the 90s, right, um, and uh, it was a customer support customer service audit and as the line workers at the time I was a line worker right I, I, did, I didn't, didn't even have my apprenticeship yet so it, all of us line workers all we had to do was remember or memorize this customer service policy and, and Ford is a huge company right they can spend massive amounts of resources for coming up with these policies and these sayings that can kind of guide your actions right that's their whole job is to do that for you and uh in, in an ISO 9000 audit, you have external auditors from a third party that come in, right? And they're going to interview the people there to, to ask if you know what that policy is. So all we had to do was memorize the policy. So I'm going to give you the policy. I, I still have it memorized, right? <laughs> Ford's at the time. Now, it's changed since then. I, somebody told me it has changed since then. I found out. Um, but at the time, the Ford's, in, Ford's uh, customer service policy was to provide superior internal and external customer service. And that's all we had to remember. If an auditor came, that's what we had to tell them, right? Then we could get the ISO 9000 certified, whatever it was at the time. And uh, to me, it was very telling that internal customers were listed first, right? Why, why wouldn't you list the people that are paying the money for, for the vehicles we were building, uh, those external customers, why wouldn't you list them first? Or why wouldn't you list the dealers or, or the, the, uh, the uh, distributors first right, in, that, in that customer support, customer service policy? Well, the idea was, goes back to that idea of, of customer support, of getting your inside the house fixed first. So then the people, your external customers, you, you know, you can't do anything until you get your, your own house sorted first, and then you can make your external customers happy. So it goes back to that importance of the external of the internal customers right along with your external customers. And both can exist side by side in issue track. We have a lot of issue track customers that external customers that are doing internal customer support when things happen. So it's very easy to have both internal and external customers exist in the same site. So I wanted to kind of go to the next one here, if I can. And what really does, what does this look like in customer, in, in customer, in issue track, right? What does 
customer service, right? So the real thing about that is, is, is the word, that word customer, right? Um, and, and we think about that customer as a person or as a company, but really that's going to turn into a, a point of contact for us, right? And, and real customer support should be like a, a conversation with that point of contact, whether it's internal or external, that should be a, a conversation. So usually when we think about that customer, we're going to have a user account or an email address or something that we respond to with that customer. It's going to be a back and forth, right? So that makes the, the customer's experience that they get from us, they're part of the conversation, right? That makes that very important. So when we think about what does this look like in issue track, what, what features are kind of really define customer service in issue track? Well, I would say number one, it's what the customer gets out of the site, right? It's those email, email notifications. Now, I, I don't want to, I'm not gonna do a poll or anything, I'm gonna spare everybody, but if you guys remember last month, Mike talked quite a bit about email notifications and he got into the, the custom messages, right? And use rewording those things so that they set expectations and, and so that they guide the customer through that conversation that you're having with them, right? And, so that, and that's how you want to look at it. Um, for our customers, you know, so when we, when we, when our customers are not logging in and I have a lot of issue track sites where the internal or external customers, doesn't matter which, are not logging in, right? They're just sending email to create issues and then your staff goes in and, and replies to those emails, right? Or web form submissions, right? Some of you, I know, I know a couple of you are using web forms, right? Um, and your staff just, they add notes so that that email goes back to the customer, whether it's an internal customer or an external customer. And that makes those email notifications just that much more important. The other piece here um, is that if your customers are logging in, then we have to think about their experience in the site, right? This is an opportunity for you as the, as the customer service provider to make a good impression and to engage them. Remember, this is a conversation and you want them to be engaged in that conversation. So things like, you know, that, that kind of affects the way you set up the site, right? Everything through the naming of your quick picks, to the issue types that you have, right? If your issue types don't make sense, it makes it harder for your customer to use them, right? And right on through the custom screens and the layout and the screen text, right? And to the branding, right? What logos do they see on the page when they log in? And all of that stuff affects that conversation between you and your customer. And that really can define customer service and issue track. When we see a site that's really set up for an external person to log in, right? And submit some kind of a customer service request, you're going to see that type of branding and that it, you should. Otherwise, you're not taking advantage of that opportunity you have to impress your customer and engage them. Now, customer service also includes making it easier for your team to respond and engage that customer, right? So that idea of it, that it's a, a, a discussion, right? I say something, the customer says something, I say something, the customer's a back and forth, right? And making that back and forth possible so that when you say something, right, the system can automatically monitor for that reply from the customer. And that includes using things like business rules, right? And substatuses to show, hey, the customer just replied to our last note. Let's go back and fix that up. Maybe we can close that issue up and get it gone, right? Um, those automations that we can set up in issue track really help get us engage the customer, right? Um, you'll see this even in our in, our, in issue tracks support site. We have fantastic customer service from issue tracks support site, but part of that is because they have these automated escalation rules. When they ask a question or when they need more information from the customer, like is this working now or did you try that, right? That type of thing. Then they'll mark the issue as pending customer, waiting for the customer to reply. And the issue tracks, automations, the, the business rules, especially escalation rules in issue track, automatically watch for that reply. And if no reply is received in a couple of days, then it sends an automatic one to re-engage that customer. Come back, hey, you know, we asked for something a couple of days ago. Do you have that information for us or not, right? And we actually, the, the best results you're going to see for customer service is when you use a mixture of those automated replies plus manual replies when appropriate to re-engage that customer and get that issue resolved. So that's what it kind of looks like, right? Um, a mixture of sort of making sure the customer's experience is correct, whether it's just via email or through other means or and 
using business rules and substatuses to engage the customer and make sure that that back and forth happens and being able, being very open and transparent about that so that like a manager can really tell, hey, I'm engaged with this customer, right? And they're coming back. Or if they're not, then you can see that very quickly. So let's get down to the actual features in issue track, right? What tools? So, oh, there we go. I forgot I included that into the thing. So let's get back to the actual tools, the nitty gritty, the actual tools and features. And I've talked about a couple of them already, but really how, does, how do you create a system? What, what tools do you really look at to give good customer service? What's gonna help your folks, your staff, and what's gonna help your customers, internal and external? Well, um, you know, the, the real thing is that the, the big thing, when, almost universally, when we think about external customers logging into the site, is visibility controls, right? If we have people that don't work for issue track and they're logging into an issue track site, I'll use issue track as the example here, like support.issuetrack.com. And those of you that have logged in, right? You want them to be limited to the stuff for their, only the stuff that applies to them. So our visibilities controls, especially organizations, become really, really important at that point, right? The, the, the staff for customer A, right? You might have six of those guys logging in, right? Well, they probably shouldn't see the issues for customer B, right? Whether those guys are logging in or not, right? So that's the idea. And, and what that translates to is usually we're gonna see multiple organizations in a customer support site, especially when we're dealing with external customers, right? Now, when we're dealing with only internal customers, then we have that same need, right? Maybe the stuff that relates to the finance team shouldn't be seen by the stuff for the customer support team or the stuff for the um, HR team maybe shouldn't be seen for the stuff, uh, should be separate from the issues for some of the other teams, right? And in that, we have this departments feature. It's a really good fit when you have internal and external customers. Or internal customers, I mean. And sometimes when we got both in the same site, we'll turn both on. We'll use the visibility controls that are provided by both of those features to really make things work well. Um, so visibility controls, that's kind of our first tool in issue track that we configure to really make that happen. Um, then the next thing we think about that I've already mentioned, right, is the email notifications. Remember, issue track sends email. You all know this because you use issue track every day, right? All of us get notifications from issue track every day. And those email notifications, those are a golden opportunity to impress and engage our customers. So they should be useful, right? Always, right? Have information that makes sense to the customer in it. And they should also be, you know, they, they should have a call to action, let the customer know what to do because he got this notification. And that's not always real clear in some of the notifications that I get, you know, what am I supposed to, do? so you added a note and there's the contents of your note. Well, what am I supposed to do about that? Do you want to reply from me or do you want to wait? Uh, that's something I see in a lot of our customer sites. We don't have a call to action in our email notifications. Um, and, and I think that's a place we can all improve. You know, once in a while, review your email notifications, go back and add, you know, modify the content as necessary. We also don't want to give too much information. That's another place we can go wrong in email notifications, right? Now, not to rehash all of Mike's discussion from last month, which I could, right? <laughs> but we just want to make sure the content is on point. It's what the customer needs, not more, not less. And there's a call to action, clear path for the customer to get their problem resolved, call to action. The other thing I kind of wanted to speak to, the, the, one of the other big features that I didn't put on my slide here that I've already talked about, are the business rules, right? Especially escalation rules, right? Your techs, your staff, I can guarantee that they've got better things to do than watch their entire queue of issues, watch their, the, the 20 issues assigned to them, however many, right? And, and wait for somebody to reply, right? That they're just, you know, they're just sitting there like that, wait for somebody to reply and, and watch, those, watch those issues for somebody to add a note to them, right? Um, or not to add a note or, or match that, that uh, or wait for no activity, right? Where they're, they're, they're watching the issues and waiting until there's no activity to send something, right? Issue tracks escalation rules, the business rules escalation rules are really good at that. You can set escalation rules so that it watches when there's been no activity for a couple of days, it sends out an automated email or it adds a note automatically and then the customer sees that note content. And that can re-engage that customer, internal or external, and hopefully bring them back in so that they can get their issue resolved. So you can engage, get that issue closed up and get it out of that, out of that guy's queue, right? We hate having an issue open when nobody's listening to us or when nobody, when one party's not engaged. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to get into was asset management. Now, in, in some cases, right, it, um, what it's, it can be a huge help for tightening up and, and really making your, your customer service efforts sing is that asset management, right? And especially when you're providing products, when, you, when say you're, you've provided, I, I have a customer that provides coffee makers for offices in a, in a certain locale. Um, and and uh, they're, that's our whole business. They're, they're, um, so, and we all, we all you, a lot of us use this, you know, when, there's, when you contract with a company to provide a coffee maker, right? And then you buy the supplies from them, uh, you, you enter a contract. Well, this, this customer does it a little bit differently. They even go as far as doing preventive maintenance and sending somebody out to order the supplies and talk to you every month about the coffee you're getting. Right, they provide a very high level of service, and they use issue track to make that happen. Now, what their need is, right, beyond just the request, hey, I need more coffee, or hey, uh, the coffee's not hot anymore when I when I get it, right? Um, they need a way of showing the actual coffee makers because those are rented by the customers. They're not owned; they're rented by the customers, owned by our customer, by this by this guy that does the the um, coffee service. So the service needs a way to, to keep track of all of those coffee, all of that equipment, right? It has a lot of value to them because the customers pay for that, right? It value. And, and we're going to get into what an asset is and what kind of that means, how that looks in issue track. But that idea of being able to take, get an overhead view and see which coffee makers are, have fewer complaints about them, which have more, right? Is it related to brand? Getting that in general, I'm going to use my air quotes here, in general, that overhead view of what's going on with, with the assets, with the coffee makers out there, with the assets. Right? Um, so, and, and that's what we're gonna talk about in our deep dive is using assets for customer, so customer service, especially when the customer's renting that asset from us or it's the, at the customer's location, but we've supplied it, we're supplying that asset. 